Well, we want to officially welcome everyone here to worship today. Uh, you know, we are, in Hebrews, it tells us we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and all the people that have supported this church, supported us over the decades. In addition, we know that uh, some are worshiping with us remotely uh, through uh, Facebook and YouTube at Greencroft and in other ways. And so uh, we get a better sense of the communion of saints just by realizing that what we see isn't all there is. Uh, so uh, we're just grateful to all those who've come here today and throughout the week. I would invite our worship team to come forward at this time. They're going to share and lead us in music and, and gladden our hearts.
Well, if you join with me on responsive psalm. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in God's commandments. Our descendants will benefit from our faithfulness. The generation of the upright will be blessed. God's righteousness endures forever. Let us rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. Let us be gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well for us to deal generously with our community, to conduct our affairs with justice. For we, the righteous, will never be moved. We are not afraid of evil tidings. Our hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Our hearts are steady. We will not be afraid. In the end, we will triumph over the evil of this age. God's righteousness endures forever. Let us cast our lot with the Lord. Amen. This time we do our service of candle lighting, and as the candles are lit, we will sing this little light of mine. the motions <laughs> so get your light up here this is a this is a song okay I've never done this with organ before <laughs> this light of mine I'm gonna let it shine this, this is the light of mine, mine. This is the time when we share our children's story. Since our altar has been moved, we can go back to doing the story right up here. Well, let's fold our hands into our Bibles. This is the Bible. We'll open it wide. There are many stories of people inside. Big people, little people, like me and you. We'll listen carefully to hear what they do. Okay. Well, our story is called Welcome home from space. Now, when people go to space, in the space station, they get to eat some of their favorite foods. And if an astronaut runs out of their favorite food, they send it up on the next supply rocket. But there are certain foods you cannot eat in space. That's because things float around. You can't have soda in space. Because the bubbles don't come to the top, they stay in the drink. So the astronauts have a sore belly because all the fizzy is right there in their tummy. They can't eat bread because when you eat bread, there are little crumbs. And we don't want crumbs floating around and getting inside the computers. 
And so instead, astronauts eat tortillas. Astronauts do not eat potato chips. Not only do they make crumbs, but they are oily, and they would get the grease on everything. And astronauts do not eat salt. Because like breadcrumbs, salt would float around and get in the machines. Instead, astronauts use a salty liquid on their food. But when they come back to Earth, they are often greeted by people with bread and salt. Bread and salt is the way people welcome other folks to their home. Now, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He meant we welcome people to the church with good things. That's why we have cookies and pretzels and crackers and other great food at our church to share. We want to welcome people and make them feel at home. So what I have for you is some bread and, oh, there it is, some salt. What we do is you take a little of the bread and you dip it in the salt. So let me sneak down here. If you want to take a piece of bread and see the little salt, just kind of push it on the salt. Would you like one? And, and Reagan, would you like a little piece of bread? Is this allowed, she's wondering? Yeah, yeah I guess it is. All right. Would you like another, anybody? It's kind of like eating a pretzel, only soft. Yeah. Goody, I think we're okay with this. Would you like another? Yeah. Take two, they're small. Well, we'll be talking about how, Jesus, how we are the salt of the earth. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for bread. Thank you, God, for friends. Thank you for the way you make us one family. Amen. Thank you for coming on up. Did you need another one? Okay. Still some salt there. Help yourself. Oh, what, you, I forgot to give you your sheets here. I, I'm so good at this. Uh. Lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, starting in chapter 5, verses 13 through 20 from the Inclusive Bible. You are the soul of the earth. What if salt were to lose its flavor? How could you restore it? It would be fit for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. You don't build a city in a hill, then try to hide it, do you? You don't light a lamp, then put it under a bushel basket, do you? No. You sit on a stand where it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before others so that they may see your good acts and give praise to your Abba God in heaven. Don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The truth is, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of the law, not even the smallest part of a letter, will be done away with until it is all fulfilled. That's why whoever breaks the least significant of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever fulfills and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your sense of justice surpass that of the religious scholars and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. At this time, the worship team will lead us.
You are the salt of the earth, and a little goes a long way, and you don't have to salt everyone's dinner. You are the light of the world, but you don't have to be the sun or even the moon or the stars. Shine your light where you can and enlighten someone's day. Ah. <sighs> One of my favorite brethren stories, uh, which I know I've told before, involves uh, Rufus Booker. About a century ago, he was riding a train. He was a brethren minister, brethren writer, and uh, he was coming back from doing a revival service. Well, something about him must not have looked saved to the earnest young man who was sharing the railway car with him because he handed him a pamphlet that said, are you saved? And he asked him, are you saved? Well, Rufus looked at the pamphlet for a minute and said, that's a very good question, and it deserves an answer. However, I would rather you go to see my friend George Hensel in Mechanicsburg, who runs the grocery store there, or check with some of my family in the Pennsylvania town of Unicorn, I will let their answer stand for mine. He was willing to let other people be asked, is Rufus Booker saved, rather than answer it with a yes or no. I guess he was trying to tell us, people will say anything, but it's what you do that matters. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Well, you know, the salt shakers on many people's tables, but not everybody's, because some of us use so much salt that it's been banished to the cupboard where we use it when nobody's looking. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, a lot of us you know, have to cut back on our salt for cardiac purposes. However, this is a rare moment in the history of humanity. For most of the history of the world, salt has been a difficult substance to find, and it is essential for life. If you were to truly cut all salt from your diet, you would die. You need to have salt. It's an essential agent within your body. Uh, as I mentioned in the children's story, uh, when, when astronauts and cosmonauts land in Kazakhstan, and one of the things that happened with the breakup of the Soviet Union is now Russian spaceships have to land in another country, which sort of makes them behave there, if nowhere else. Um, when, they, when astronauts and cosmonauts land in Kazakhstan, they are greeted by Kazakhs in very bright and multicolored costumes. And they are given bread with salt. And you break off the bread and dip it in the salt and eat it. Um, almost all of them do it. A few are nauseous enough to say, can I hold off on that? But it's a little bit of taste of earth and welcome back. Because that is a traditional greeting or welcome in many cultures. Bread and salt. It's a way of making people feel welcome. And it's a reminder of how essential it is. Uh, it says in the not-biblical book of Sirach, part of the Apocrypha, which first Christians considered to be biblical, it says the basic necessities of human life are water and fire and iron and salt and wheat flour and milk and honey. That's, that's a nice list, and salt is right in there with all the rest of it. Uh, it is, but Jesus goes on to say something that's puzzling. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, chemically, salt can't become not salt, unless you take the elements apart, which is not the kind of thing that we normally do on the table. But if you mix salt with mud, it may still be salt in the midst of all that mud, but it's not worth putting on food. And it's a reminder that if we are the salt of the earth, that part of what is our essential saltiness are the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. 
that it's not always what we say, but what we do that makes it clear that we are Christians. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I've made this point before, but it's worth remembering, because this is bad science, but good theology. In the ancient world, it was believed that light came out of your eye, bounced off things, and that's how you saw. Now, that's not what exactly happened, but what this caused them to reflect upon is when we look on somebody with the evil eye, that those words, if looks could kill, are actually true. As many spouses have learned at the breakfast table. Or any other time of the day, actually. But also the scriptures, as I have mentioned before, speak of the good eye. Uh, in opposition to the evil eye, it says in Proverbs 22, verse 9, those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Well, that word is not generous. That word is the good eye. Those who look on, on people with the good eye elevate their life because they are generous. They share their bread and their salt. They are, making, they are doing something active. And you yourself, whether, whether you, anything exchanges hands, whether you actually had cake in your hand to leave on the pastor's doorstep. Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> Just by looking with that warm and tender eye, you let people know things are okay. Yesterday, I ran to the uh, grocery store to pick up a few extra items that we did not have for what we were making that day. And, uh, you know, I always stop and talk to who's ever working there at the counter. I, I think it's important just to be nice. These people are not our servants. They're our friends. They're the people we share this planet with. So I said, after greeting, and we kind of said hi, I said, so how much longer on your shift? And she said, about six minutes. And I said, oh, that's so little time. You didn't even have to be nice to me. You're almost out the door. And then she corrected me. She said, even when I'm on my break, when I go sit at one of those tables near the door, I try to greet people with a smile and a kind word. I may not be able to solve their problems, but maybe I can shine a little light into their day. And I thought, boy, she's been reading my sermon. Because that's exactly what I want to tell you. You are the salt of the earth, and a little goes a long way, and you don't have to salt everybody's dinner. And you are the light of the world. You don't have to be the sun or the moon or the stars, but you can shine your light wherever you can and enlighten someone's world. Uh, now, in uh, I, I, one of the things Jesus is encouraging us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, is to put our attention upon those who are marginalized, who are suffering, who may not be seen. And I'd like to invite our uh, um, friends at this time there in the AV booth to uh, shine a little light on this painting that I introduced you to last week. As I mentioned, the Sermon on the Mount by uh, John Bruegel the Elder is only 10 and a half inches high and 14 and a half inches wide. And when you get really close, you begin to realize he has painted every single face and made real people. Now, here in the corner, what you're seeing uh, is very interesting. Right off on the edge, you can see that somebody is selling pretzels. Way off in the distance, Jesus is giving the words of life. Right now, he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. These people are among hundreds that are there. And they may not be hearing it right now, but look what's happening. There's a child with their hands up, and then another child who's sitting in the arms of somebody who's eating one of those pretzels and looking, maybe, maybe seeing that this child needs something. There's a man who's, who's dressed in uh, blue, who looks a, a little more aged and having a, some difficulties, but he's smiling. 
because here is a man who's holding bread in his hands and who is sharing it. Others are watching, looking around, and uh, noticing what is happening. You know, he may not have heard a single word of the Sermon on the Mount, but he is living the Sermon on the Mount. The fellow who is seeing that the poor in the midst, those on the margins, these people on the very edge of a great crowd who surround the Lord of life are living the Sermon on the Mount. We're not always able to do something, but what we can do, we can do. Uh, the, uh, the man, it, really what he has is the good eye. What the man is, it has become is the salt of the earth. If you want to, once again, expand and go back to the original one that shows the entire painting, now you can barely see those people there in the very front, and Jesus is there towards the very back speaking. And you realize that people may not even be in church this morning, and yet they may be doing God's work. And we can be oversatisfied because we've answered that question, are you saved to another person's satisfaction, and we think that it's over. Well, I'm going to repeat one last time the real message that I want you to get, because as Jesus says, uh, you know, he's not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And fulfilling them doesn't mean that next week you need to be able to come here and recite Leviticus from memory. You, Jesus says that every jot and tittle, every single dot and comma and funny little line of the Torah, of the law, which was known as the way, will be fulfilled. He did not come to abolish it. But it is fulfilled when we are the salt of the earth, making a little difference, not by overwhelming a dish with too much salt, but by simply changing the composition of it enough that all the flavors become bright and alive. And we are the light of the earth when we shine through our good eye, once again, not very accurate scientifically, but pretty good theologically, when we shine our good eye on those who are walking in darkness because now on them a light has shined. You don't have to be the sun or the moon or the stars. Just shine this little light of mine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen. Uh, our, our hymn, take, I want our, uh, our companies can take, can take their time. Our hymn is, You Are Light of the Earth, O People. I forget the exact title, but uh, we'll be sharing that here in a moment. Uh, one of my favorite songs. You are salt for the earth, but then you'll be light in the second stanza. That's it. So salt first, then light.
Well, prayer focus for this week is on health. One of the things we all value is our health. For some of us, maintaining our health seems to be easy. We have never struggled against a major illness or medical condition, nor have we had to work very hard to maintain health. Some of us have chronic illnesses, which despite our best efforts to maintain our well-being, defy every treatment or protocol. Some of us maintain a semblance of health by constantly monitoring our weight, our eating, and our lifestyles, and even we are faithful to a particular regiment, we struggle. This is nothing fair or equal about conditions and their requirements. It is easy to judge someone else and to think yourself, if only they did this or that, they would be well. This is especially true of chronic conditions, which are difficult to pinpoint, treat, and especially relieve symptoms. Rather than sit in judgment of another, let us listen carefully, respect each other, and pray with each other for healing and hope. Unless we are someone's physician, it is not our place to diagnose or suggest treatment. Regardless of our circumstances, we are called to be partners with God and with each other in work and work together for health, wholeness, and peace in our lives. Whether we consider ourselves healthier than most or struggling more than most, let us offer, offer up our lives in service to God, even as we encourage each other in God's name in our respective walks through life. This week, our prayer focus is health. Let us resolve to pray with and for each other. In the name of Jesus, the healer of our every ill. Let us now sing together number 402, Christian, Let Your Burning Light. for our benediction. Go in peace, knowing God has received the offerings of our wealth, our varying levels of health and well-being, and our resolves to be salt and light for the earth. This time our worship team will lead us in our benediction song.